Okay, so uh, you may remember that uh, uh, last week uh, we found a, a, um, a problem, a problem with the asynchronous behavior. Uh, for example, we had uh, when we had different uh, asynchronous operations that we need in some way to synchronize. Uh, um, it's a problem because uh, by definition, a synchronous function just uh, um, start when you are uh, calling them, but they will finish the execution on their own time, basically, uh, without any control. And the only way of uh, uh, being sure that something, for example, a query here, uh, this insert query has terminated, the only sure way is to put something inside the callback that the query calls uh, when its operation is completed. Okay. Otherwise, uh, we, we, we risk uh, of doing something like this, like, uh, uh, no, sorry, I see the wrong window. This window, yeah. Let me make it bigger. Uh, where I try to put in a loop uh, the run and the uh, count, uh, no? like the example that we did last week. And if I try to run it, uh, uh, this file, you see that uh, it's printing some error, some numbers, but uh, as we saw in the slide, but it's also <laughs> for real, uh, the, the numbers are, are skipping some way, okay? So uh, probably the, the correct number of inserts, it will be done. The correct number of selects uh, will be done, but uh, they will not be interleaved as this sort of sequential code uh, would seem to, to imply, okay? Uh, are there any ways of over, overcoming that? Uh, well, there can be some ways. I, I try to, for example, I just quickly show you some, some code that is, is on GitHub, but don't take an example from that. I try to force a synchronous behavior and uh, uh, I had to basically create a state machine here that's saying, okay, whenever, uh, I uh, query is finished, then call the insert. And when the insert is finished, call the print. And uh, in the callback for the insert and for the print, that are methods here, uh, I call this sort of ne next method with, that will control what happens next. Mm -hmm. So it's a very complicated solution, totally unreadable. Mm -hmm. Uh, and in this case, in this solution, that would synchronize the queries. Of course, the code would run much slower. Okay, uh, if you measure the completion time, a synchronous code like this will be slower because uh, there will be waits, okay, waiting times. Uh, every operation will wait until the database completed uh, its, its job. So an asynchronous code is faster, but in this case, it's also incorrect. So what we want to do is to be able uh, to run asynchronous code, okay, when it's needed, but also at the same time, to, uh, to be able to easily wait for the completion of a task without getting crazy with, with strange uh, control structures uh, uh, that synchronize something that would be as, uh, otherwise asynchronously. And this uh, problem was solved thanks to a new uh, construct language called promises, which is a, a type of object in, uh, in, in JavaScript that was designed specifically to avoid this uh, sort of callback hell. So every operation, whatever you want to do, must be inside a callback. So whatever, what you tend to do is to have a, a call a function and then have a callback uh, where you get some answer to this question and then go on with your code inside the callback to be sure that this code will be executed after you get uh, the answer. And, but at that point, you will get a second callback and then a third one nested inside each other, okay? It becomes really unreadable and difficult to maintain this kind of, of code, okay? Uh, just to be sure that the different calls are executed in order, you would have to nest them. So it's something that adds complexity for, for something that should be simple. But since uh, in JavaScript, most operations are asynchronous, uh, this kind of code was very frequent, but we want to uh, go forward and make something better. 
and that's why <clears throat> promises were were invented basically it has a core language uh, feature that tries to summarize the important steps uh, of what happens when you need to call an asynchronous function okay um it was introduced uh, uh in yes uh, in 2017 hmm? basically so but it's, it was spread quite uh, uh, fast uh, because it was very uh, useful hmm? what what is a promise the promise is an object that represents that some operation will eventually complete okay so when i'm calling an asynchronous function the asynchronous function will not return the result right now because it can't the asynchronous function will return right now a promise an object that will tell me okay this the result of this opera or operation sooner or later will be available this promise is an object and this object has some callbacks uh, that will be executed uh, when the operation is completed but the important thing is that we have this promise in hand this object and we can use the, the object we can use the object that will contain it doesn't contain yet okay but it will contain the result of the operation and we can pass this promise around to other functions that can do operations on the result of the promise of course these operations will need to be asynchronously executed when the result of the promise will be available so the idea is that uh, with normal callbacks uh, we can either go on and don't wait for the result which is the normal the default or we can wait uh, until the result inside the callback uh, with promises there is a third way we can go on with something that we hold a reference to the future result uh, again it's a conceptual step which is not easy to get uh, to, to grasp at the first uh, examples of course um, so we'll try to to break it down and see how it works uh, but so there is the two advantages of these promises one is that we can continue the computation and wait for the result when we really need it the second is that uh, actually they have uh, they also solve the problem of error, error handling um, that uh, in uh, normal callbacks there was no standard way of ending errors every function every library had their own conventions uh, with promises there is a standard way of saying okay this is the result that i'm returning or this is an error condition that i'm returning and their condition will also be translated into try catch exceptions in the language so there, there are a very strong binding between the normal um the synchronous normal error handling exception handling and the asynchronous condition that may happen um with asynchronous calls okay so uh these promises uh, basically have two sides this promises object one are uh, the creation of a promise and the other is the consuming of the of the promise itself creating a promise means uh, um, returning a result uh, from an asynchronous function that will be available in the future so i cannot return a result but i create a promise that will contain the result this is the creation i create a promise and inside the promise i will put the result and we will see the result will be a callback function but uh it's in the next slide and then what can i do uh with this object okay the, the promise as a state initially uh the promise is uh, pending so it will contain result but it doesn't yet but then it can resolve uh, to a fulfilled state so the, the state inside the promise may change it may become a fulfilled promise so the promise has been fulfilled so here is the result now we have the result or the promise can turn into a rejected promise so i promised something but sorry i can't maintain it because there's some error and so the promise i made i will reject this promise there is this strange terminology about the the meaning of a promise in the normal language um 
creating a promise is just as simple as creating a new object. So we call the promise constructor um, that just creates a new object uh, of type promise. And these objects only takes uh, one parameter. This, this creation function only takes one parameter. You see this new promise is open here and closed there. And there is only one parameter, which is a function. So creating a promise means creating a new object with the promise constructor function and giving this constructor one parameter, a callback function. Um, this callback function will be called by the mechanics inside the promise, of course, we are not calling it. Uh, but this promise, this callback function uh, gets two parameters. One is called resolve and the other is called reject. Uh, these parameters are functions. So this is where it gets complicated. So I'm creating an object that takes a callback function, right? When the callback function will be called, it will receive two parameters and each of them is a function. If it's a function that I don't write, it's a function that is defined inside the promise object. So it's not my function, but I may call this function. Okay. So basically what happens is that in my callback, I write the code to execute asynchronously. So inside here, inside these braces, inside these callbacks, I am separate from the main flow of operation. I'm not in the main thread. I'm in a separate execution stream inside the callback. Okay, so I can do whatever asynchronous I need to do, a query to the database or whatever. Okay. Um, and when I finished, uh, when you know this asynchronous code will complete maybe inside a callback and maybe uh, there are other mechanisms that we see later we can call the function resolve so i repeat the function resolve is just the first parameter of my callback is not a function i define is not a function i can see anywhere it's just the first parameter of the callback that by convention we call resolve that will tell the promise that the promise object will need to turn from pending to fulfilled. And the argument of resolve is the value to be returned by the promise. Okay, so we don't say that the function returns a value and a synchronous function returns a promise that this promise will resolve to a value in the future okay um, or there may be something wrong with our asynchronous code some error some mistake some data missing some connection failed or whatever and to tell this we can call the reject function so it's the second parameter that we get in our callback and in the reject function also we can pass an object containing the description of uh, of what happened okay so a promise resolves in two ways it resolves into a fulfilled promise with the return value so this sum value as Alfred is saying in the chat uh, is the um, actual value computed by the query it may be one string maybe a number maybe an array of objects or whatever you want or uh, it may be or the promise may resolve to a failure to a failed promise and again i will get uh, an object uh, describing the reason of the failure here is just a message that it may be any type of object here okay uh, resolve martina resolve and reject are not keywords hmm? are not keywords are just the names of these two parameters of these two arguments so you can call them a and b they are just you know, the, the arguments in the function. So you can call the function parameters uh, as you like, 
usually by convention we call them resolve and reject uh, so that we can easily recognize uh, in our code when we are really finishing the the, the promises uh, or when we are really generating an error so there is just a convention you can call them a, uh, how you like the definition is that the first parameter of the callback will signal to the promise then that the result is fulfilled the second parameter when called is a function that when called will signal to the promise that the uh, promise is failed hmm? is to be considered failed but the names are just arbitrary right um like uh, uh, marco is also saying that resolve and reject are not functions defined by us no they are functions provided by the promise and they will be passed to us so we, we don't see them we just call them okay uh, you know it's one step forward when we did some uh, asynchronous code last week uh, in or in fun also, uh, let's see for example in functional in a functional execution here in the database uh, we had some parameter here that was provided by the database provided by the caller and so we were just using a value we called rows we could have called it in any other way we are using it because it's a parameter that is given to my callback here is the same idea the uh, uh, the additional complexity is just that this parameter is a function and is not a value hmm? um, marco saying that what happens while the async function is being executed and so is not fulfilled or rejected so you're saying that uh, in your in our code you run up to the uh, closing brace of the function and you never call a result or reject okay uh, there is a there are a lot of implicit resolutions uh, for promises um, if you do a return of a value this return will be automatically uh, encapsulated into a promise if you don't do any return it's like you are returning and a fulfilled promise with the value undefined if you do if you throw an error uh, then this error so this exception will be wrapped inside the rejected uh, promise and so on so there's a lot of mechanisms that uh, uh, automatically convert uh, uh, a synchronous result into a promise containing uh, uh, the result of course only if you are inside this uh, uh, this callback method of course mm -hmm. um, if nothing goes wrong reject is never called yes the the idea is that you call either resolve or reject only one of them and when you call that you should complete your execution okay you should not do anything more after calling resolve uh, technically resolve doesn't conclude the, the, the function you know, the code could also continue because the resolve is just a callback that will be called but the, it doesn't make any sense uh, to do anything more after calling result because the caller will not see the result of it. Hmm? Uh, Giuseppe is, uh, so these two functions are the mechanism of JavaScript to update the promise state. Yes, yes, exactly. Okay, I create a promise uh, and inside the callback, uh, the callback itself manages the state of the promise. Hmm? Uh, so this is where we are creating this is the more complex part. We should decide what to execute asynchronously, when the result is available, and when there is some error. It's all very standardized, okay? So it's complex because we are thinking asynchronously, but it's all very standardized. The next step would be to consume this project, promise. So uh, whoever uses the promises, sorry, um, I can say you can create a promise, but the next slide just tell me that the promise can also be returned by a function uh, if you want. It's, ju it's just a normal object, so it is the same. Um, what I want to say is how can I use the result of a promise? Hmm? Um, the, so imagine we have a function that will return a promise or any piece of code that will create a promise and then this promise object has some methods that they can call that specify callbacks to be executed when the promise changes their state so there is a, a then method for example on a promise 
on the promise object, the then method will specify what happens when the promise is resolved. Remember that we are executing this code right now in the synchronous. So I'm calling the promise. The function will return a promise that is still pending. There's no result yet. But on this promise, which is not resolved yet, I am calling a method telling uh, what should I do when the promise is fulfilled. And of course, I cannot do anything right now because the promise is not fulfilled yet. And so I have to provide a callback function that will be called when the promise is fulfilled. So in a way, inside the promise, I have a way of knowing when to resolve the promise. As soon as the promise is resolved, if uh, sort of then registers a callback on the completion of the promise. And so when the promise is fulfilled, then the then um, callback is called. And of course, the parameter of the callback will be the exact value that we resolved inside the promise. So it's a long way of going from having some value, using this value to resolve the promise, and uh, setting a callback that when the promise is resolved, will get this result, this value, and can use this value. Or we can uh, define with a catch method on the promise another callback that will be executed in the case of failure. So it's all symmetric, basically it's all conventions. So I can define what should I do when the promise is fulfilled and what should I do when the promise is, uh, um, is in error, is rejected. With these two methods that are called then and catch. Again, just remember that we are in the asynchronous world. And so the argument of then is not executed now, but it will be executed when the promise will be fulfilled. And so when the asynchronous code will be completed. Okay, now we turn to some examples. Um, Dario mentioned in the chat that two different promises uh, can, can resolve actually out of order. If I have two independent promises, each of them has their own life cycle. Okay, I have a way of chaining them so that uh, I can only tell a second promise to start when the first is complete, but I have to provide it. Otherwise, each promise is independent from each other. What I can do synchronously is to write my code and be sure that it will be executed si not synchronously, but uh, sequentially after the promise has been executed. And what we see is that uh, there's a difference here. The code to be executed here is not in the callback of the asynchronous code that will be nested inside, inside, inside. It's outside of the code, outside of the asynchronous code, in my main code, basically. So in this way, I can uh, avoid the nesting of all the um, callbacks because the callbacks are specified with this dang uh, keyword in the main code. Mm -hmm. But of course, we, when we create some code, I hope it can be um, uh, easier to understand. Just to complete, uh, um, dang is uh, the method that can be called uh, when the uh, with a callback when the promise is fulfilled uh, you can use that then with two parameters with two callbacks to specify uh, at the same time what to do when the promise is fulfilled or rejected or otherwise it's better to use the catch method for specifying the callback for rejection and there's also finally method also on the promises that will uh, specify a callback that will be executed in both cases after the um, promise is resolved or rejected in any case uh, i execute this code so i will it, this code will be executed always but after the promise is finished and this interesting thing here is that all, all these methods return promises 
Okay, so if I call the then method, I, I'm registering a callback, but then I can still do a dot catch or dot then or dot finally method that will operate on the promise that is returned by this then method. So I can do an operation, then another operation, and this second then will apply to the promise returned by the first then. And the promise returned by the first then will be completed when the callback is executed. So I can have really specify a sequential set of operations to do only after the first promise has completed. So we can create chains of thens and catches with this promise that will tell us, allow us to tell the order in which the, uh, the code is executed. So just as a graphical reminder, I'm creating a promise here, resolve object, resolve the passes a value X, and this value will be the argument of the callback of then. If I reject the value, this value will be the argument of the callback of the cache method of that promise. So this is the shrink down uh, the basic center that we need to use uh, when you create when we consume pro uh, promises. Um, so uh, coming to the questions in the chat, Maria Luisa is referring to this function here, uh, so basically to the yeah uh, this example. So, yeah, um, when we are calling this uh, wait promise function. Sorry, there's a. Uh, it should be called wait and not wait promise because these and these are, are the same uh, are the same function. Um, you're saying, uh, does this execute this program stop the execution of the program? No, no. It will start uh, the execution of the asynchronous code. So inside this uh, wait uh, function or wait promise function, okay. You see, what, what do we have here? This would be a possible definition of this function. We, let's think synchronously. Synchronously, we only have one statement, return new promise. So synchronously, we are just creating an object. This object has a callback, but the callback will be executed on the side asynchronously. So when I call this wait function, it will create a promise object and return immediately. Okay, return immediately and uh, uh, give me an object. Then I'm calling the then method on this object and the then method will just register a callback onto that object. And the then will return immediately. Again, cache will return another callback on the object and return immediately. So in just, you know, uh, one millisecond, we are here. And we still haven't done anything. Okay, uh, the timer hasn't started yet. When we get here, asynchronously, the promise object will call on its own time this callback. And the callback uh, uh, probably will set up, uh, do some asynchronous code, like, for example, setting a timeout if the duration is positive. And uh, this timeout, uh, again, will start. Uh, so this callback will be executed asynchronously. But on its own, it will also maybe call other asynchronous functions. Sooner or later, somebody will call the resolve function uh yeah we are passing the callback to another asynchronous function so that that uh, the, the, the timeout function will call the resolve method so i'm doing a closure here of this parameter but it's just a detail let's not get lost in the, in the details let's think about the the timing of the operations so asynchronously i'm executing this callback this callback will execute in me uh, and return immediately but after returning or before returning sorry it started some other asynchronous operation in this case and this other asynchronous operation sooner or later will call the resolve in the meantime the main code 
continued to do something else. Only when the timeout uh, uh, ticks and calls the resolve method, the resolve will be here of this promise. This promise is here. And uh, uh, the resolution of the promise will call the damn method. So at this point, I'm really calling this callback and only here, only now. Hmm? So it's all delayed. Just remember that when you're writing some code, uh, the code here, the then is not, not executed right now. You shouldn't expect a result in the lines after that. Usually you can do anything useful after, after launching some asynchronous code because you are just one millisecond after the launch of the code and you don't have any, any even a small portion of the result. Um, Mario is asking uh, the syntax of the argument on in then uh, then only has one argument. Maybe you can sit here, which is a callback. So uh, then receives a callback. This callback has uh, one parameter, which is the the value returned by uh, like we see here. Then contains one callback. This callback has one argument, and this argument is a reference to the value that has been resolved inside the um, the, the promise creation, the promise call. Um, uh, but, but again, we we are just writing. Uh, um, in a second, we are going to write uh, some examples. Uh, from where is taken the final argument? Good question. I don't remember. Uh, we need to check the documentation. So let's also be realistic and uh, MDN. Sorry. Let's check on the, the documentation website. Okay, that is explaining so that every now and then uh, always try to, to go and check. Uh, then catch uh, chain promises finally. So let's see the finally method. Finally, returns a promise is a function with uh, no parameters. Hmm. So uh, in this case, uh, uh, the, the final is just executing some code without knowledge of the values. Uh, usually, you, are, you will be using probably some closures to you know, uh, clean up uh, uh, some database connection or some other resources that you had opened. Hmm. So you see the finally is a, is, a, um, is a callback with no parameters. Thanks for the question. Um, Lorenzo is saying that chaining here is like nesting in the other version. Yes, more or less, yes. Okay, we, inside, but we do that, okay. From the syntax point of view, it's easier because it's sort of sequential is and not nested. So it doesn't add too much to the complexity. Um, Giuseppe, again, is asking an interesting question like, uh, the, you're saying, okay, the catch operation, um, does it operate on the original promise or on the promise transformed by the then operation? Uh, of course, it will operate on the last one because I'm calling a, a method on the result of a previous uh, uh, method call, but inside the mechanism of the promises will propagate the catch, okay? So in the case, this promise will fail this then is skipped and so the new promise will call its own catch method so it's uh, it, it will make sense basically uh, they are all different promises because they are transformed by the addition of these methods but they do the right thing basically so if you if a promise fail fails the first catch method in the chain will be called and all the damn methods will be skipped and also the other way around. If the promise uh, uh, succeeds, uh, 
the first then method in the chain is called and the others will be skipped. I don't recommend nesting uh, catches and thens in different orders. Uh, it's better to have separate promises just to understand what is happening, okay? Because the, the, also the connection of, the, this, of these methods is not so easy. Um, okay, uh, so we, yes, you, you can use then and catch them finally being, uh, in, in sequence. Um, for to, ge to get the general case, uh, maybe not uh, not always. You don't always need to do that, but it's the general case. And the then can be also it can be more than one. Okay. Especially because in the then method you can return some values that will be used by the next promise. Mm -hmm. um, in slide fifty one. Uh, do we write prom then and not prom dot then? Uh, yes, you're right. You're right. Uh, because I, I make confusion with the, I didn't test this code. <laughs> so it happens that uh, I make confusion between the uh, promise returned by a function that I should call the function and then have the promise. But here I was just using it. Uh, so. You're right, that let me correct this code here. So in this case, there are no uh, parentheses because uh, it's just a, a, a variable in my code is not a function. Thanks for the correction. Um, Cosma, um, how can the promise mechanism avoid nested callbacks if the call of nest promise depends on the results of a promise? Uh, okay, uh, on the previous promise. Um, of course, there is the chaining of operations, but it's not nesting. If I have many, um, uh, if I have a promise P on which do I apply something to be executed uh, when it's uh, finished and then something else and then something else again, okay? What you see is that there's not nesting in the sense that this then is not inside this callback, but is outside. Nesting would have the second callback inside the code, inside the braces of the first one. So adding levels of indentation. Here, the, the different thens are not one inside the other, but they are one after the other. This is the big step, okay? So you don't, you don't need to modify the behavior of some callback be, just because you have to do something else after that. So you don't have to inject code inside a callback, which is already complicated to think of. And so you just, okay, I complete this callback and then I know that some other callback will be called with the result of the first one and, and, and so on. So you don't need to get the results here like we did remember here uh, we said the only way of of using this value is to put some code inside the callback now we're saying the way and we are show how to do that with promises the way of uh, executing uh, of getting this value is to attach a then handler that will get the value after it has been processed after, after it has been computed so the, this simplifies a lot of the code. Um, if uh, we consider Vincenzo, the callback function is a wait for a mouse click, the code just continues on its own execution. And at the very moment in which there will be a mouse click, the then part will be executed. Right, exactly, exactly. We are just setting out, out what will happen when, and the when will be decided synchronously. Hmm? Okay, so maybe, so, um, uh like, like for example we are we have an example of chaining uh with some uh, hypothetical uh, api for github for example so i may have a call for getting the information about uh, some repository okay in my code so this is actual code that the, some libraries can provide um of course getting information from a github repository is a network operation so it will take time and it will return a promise. So this method here, this function here, will return a promise. This promise will, will contain information 
So to, to, to tell the complete sentences, I should say the promise will resolve to a value that will contain information about the repository. Okay, so to be short, we say that the, the promise returns this, uh, this object, but actually it's more complex, not the mechanism. And, uh, um, and so we have this callback that will be executed when the call to GitHub is finished. And we have this information. Now we can also issue another call for extracting some information from this repository. Uh, so maybe the issue, the issues in the repository. So this information is already inside this object. This get issue doesn't need to be asynchronous by itself. It's just extracting some information from an object that we have. But it needs to be executed asynchronously because the data in which it relies will be available asynchronously. And so in this case, this get issue will analyze this object and return some information about it. For example, the issue. And if I want to do something on this issue, uh, I need to do that asynchronously when these information, so the, the return of this uh, get issue will be available. Uh, we have a shortcut here. We are returning a variable from a function, from a callback function, and this variable, this number, or sorry, the, this object will be automatically converted into a promise that we can analyze later. So like we said, there's no, here we are like, it's like we were creating a new promise that will contain the result of get issue. It's all being shortcut just by returning a value because we already, we are already into a promise context. So every return value is automatically encapsulated into a promise. And so when we have this value, we can extract the owner ID and then from the owner I can send it and so on, okay? So these operations, some of these operations may imply a synchronous code. So querying GitHub, for example, some other ju might just only imply synchronous code, local code, but nevertheless, they should be changed in this way because we want to be sure to execute that code only when the parameters, the data they depend on is available, right? <clears throat> um, so we have this chain Instead, instead of a nesting. And from the syntax point of view, it's much more uh, readable. And at the end, we had just one catch that will catch a, an error in either of these, uh, of these long uh, set of promises. Mm -hmm. So instead of having the error handling inside each, every, each and every callback. Um, okay. Um, of course, uh, okay, this is just a detail that what you do inside the callback uh, should always return a result, uh, anything, maybe true or whatever, um, because this result will be wrapped in the promise and will allow other callbacks to be executed. If Even if you don't have really anything real to, result, to return, do return something. Okay. Uh, to answer Alessandro, uh, you said, how does it work, uh, uh, you know, behind the uh behind the the front end um, uh, we will see how it works uh, uh, when we deal with the um, with the event loop uh, inside the browsers okay so um uh, for now we just know that it works uh, and how this asynchronous code works uh, is uh, will be explained in this called the event loop and we'll explain them when the, when we go into the into the browser events uh, this is where the real complexity happens actually there's a sort of a schedule scheduler inside javascript uh, that schedules the execution of all these functions in a given order uh, it's not a preemptive scheduler like in operating systems it's a it's a cooperative scheduler uh, that will uh, decide which piece of code to execute and whenever we launch something uh, asynchronous it will put into it will be put into a stack of functions to be executed so we get some more details uh, in, a, in a couple of weeks uh, Giuseppe what happens if the asynchronous code has been completed before we register the callback with the then uh, on the main sync flow uh, it doesn't happen basically uh, because uh, we are immediately constructing the um, the asynchronous code as has not been executed yet so it cannot be finished 
when I do this code here, remember that it's all synchronous. So I'm creating the, the promise object. I'm returning it immediately, immediately, and uh, uh, immediately I'm calling them. But immediately is not a race condition like I'm doing it faster. No, uh, I'm still in synchronous code. And so no asynchronous code can be can run until this function is finished. Uh, uh, again, it's a detail about the, the, the event loop, but uh, a function will never be interrupted. Okay, if I have a sequence of synchronous code, that will always run to completion before any asynchronous code will start. And when some asynchronous code starts, it will not be interrupted by any other asynchronous code. So everything is serialized by the event loop scheduler. Uh, so hopefully this, the, there's no race condition in setting callbacks to asynchronous code. Um, Lorenzo, what you want to execute a chain of function more times by, but sequentially, like in the for loop, uh, that will be uh, will become complicated, and we'll see the next uh, addition to the syntax to help uh, us doing that. Okay, uh, we are still lacking a mechanism of waiting for a promise to complete, and if you wait uh, ten minutes, uh, we will see how. Um, the order of dependencies LM, of the return promises is just sequential order. Uh, there is no real dependency here. Uh, it's just uh, when this returns a promise. When this promise is fulfilled, then we call this, uh, uh, sorry, this call back here. This call back will execute eventually this function and this function will eventually return a value. This value will be inside the promise. When this promise is resolved, we are calling the second callback and so on. So everything is sequential. Like every time you are calling resolve inside one promise, then you are calling the callback of the then operation outside the promise. It's not a synchronous call, basically. It's a, okay, I'm scheduling this callback to execute. So it may not uh, execute immediately right now, but it will execute with this value. Hmm? So it's just a, a chain of operations. Uh, are the then function, Marco is asking, executed at the same time and internally waiting for the fulfillment of previous promises? They ex no, the, uh, they execute in sequence. So there is a, a sort of a list of callbacks to be executed. They are not, uh, there is no real parallelism in JavaScript, okay? JavaScript is a single threaded execution environment. So only one callback is executing at a time. We are, we are sequentializing them. From our point of view of programmers, uh, we should be aware that we don't know the, the order in which the operations will be executed. So for us, they are asynchronous because they will happen sooner or later, but we don't know exactly when compared to our main code. Uh, but uh, when Again, the, the basic assumption is that when I'm running a callback, uh, uh, only that code can be running, and the other code should be waiting for their turn to execute. Uh, okay, uh, okay, about the syntax, this symbol is just the name of a variable. I could call it X or whatever, saying, okay, I don't care. Usually, it's the don't care variable. I don't care about this variable. I will not use it. So, to make it explicit that I don't want to use it uh, by convention, we are using an underscore, but just uh, convention. So, uh, I think enough for enough with the, um, with, the um, with theory. Let's try to turn our, uh, say, program that makes queries into the database uh, uh, with, with promise, try to convert it with promises, okay? So uh, let's try to make uh, uh, queries uh, EJS, hmm? where we copy, of course, some code here to open the database. And so let's try to use a function to, uh, for example, do the count of all the elements, okay? The very simple query. Um, so we know that what the query is, is this one. So let me take this code that we already had last week. But we want to encapsulate that into a function. 
call we can we may call it uh, I don't know count rows okay and we know that this function will execute asynchronous code okay uh, so we return a new promise and that's only it's the only synchronous operation that we are doing inside this function this new promise gets one parameter which is a callback resolve reject arrow code and i open the code so this is the code that will be executed asynchronously by the callback of the promise and what should this code do execute the query so uh, we do this select for example and uh, like the uh, sqlite 3 interface requires uh, the select will uh, uh, require also a callback and so this call the second parameter so the bit dot all as a second parameter the second parameter is a callback with error and rows result And what do we do in this case so again we are nesting of course we are creating the promise so right now we are in the wild asynchronous realm in where we are nesting callbacks at this point we know that this callback will be executed when this query has completed and this query will start when the callback of the promise will be called which is sooner or later after the promise has been created now if i have some error i can just tell that the promise i'm constructing failed so i can reject reject the promise with this error message sorry otherwise else, I know that the rows parameter contains the result. And so I can resolve the, the, with, the, with the value. In this case, uh, I don't need all the rows. I just need the, tot, uh, the, the first value of the first row. Okay. And so I'm resolving a, a value, which is the uh, count of what I was trying to do. Okay, so this closes the if, this closes the callback, this closes the db.all, and this closes the callback of the promise, this callback closes the creation of the promise, and this one closes the function. So we have usually in the last uh, page of, uh, of a javascript program we have just a sequence of uh, of closing braces and, and parentheses hmm? so this is a function that will execute my query wrapped encapsulated into a promise so if we want to uh, print this value what i should do is just to uh create the promise and when the promise is finished we take the value and print it Right. So the operation to do with the code, it's interesting because it's not inside the callback. In our previous code, we had to do the printing inside the callback. So this function would be barely reusable because it's very, it's, it was bound to a specific action. Here, uh, the function that contains the promise is only, uh, you know, uh, its goal is just to return the value. What I do with this value is decided 
by the color of the function, not inside the function itself, right? And of course, uh, just to appreciate that this is a synchronous, let's try to log before and after. And see what happens. Okay, so let's hope we don't have any errors here. Queries underscore p node. Queries underscore p. Okay, you see before, after, and then the number. Of course, of course, because you see that we are executing this code. Then the synchronous part of this code which is basically new promise and register this callback, nothing more. Then we are executing this other console.log. And when we finish executing the synchronous call, then the, all the callbacks will start. And so the first one to be called will be this one and then so on. Uh, the query will call its second callback and the result will call the third callback which is in the then code okay yes of course uh, i should close the db okay uh, it's interesting that wh where should i close the db this is a, it's an interesting point because if i close the db here it may fail because i'm closing the db maybe before really no, uh, completing the operation. So probably it could crash here. Let's see. No, it works, but of course it depends. No, on the on the on the speed of the execution of the because also the closing the DB inside is an asynchronous function. So its uh, behavior may be before or later this function. So in this case it works, but if I have more work to do, probably it will fail. Uh, I had a, um, a bug in, in my code when I prepared this exercise just for this reason. You could call the db.close, uh, so you can, you may have different solutions to it, depends on what your program is doing. Uh, one possibility would be to open and close the connection inside the promise. So in a promise, I open a connection, I do the query and close that connection. If I have many promises, each promise will open its own connection. But it's also a waste of time opening and closing connection uh, all the times. So somebody was suggesting uh, to have another uh, then or finally uh, here to close the database. Uh, for example, finally, db.close. Uh, this only works if I have one query to do. If I need to do a second query right after that, uh, uh of course i cannot do that because i i need to close uh, uh i will need to close the connection after all the queries has been completed mm -hmm. so uh, i need another mechanism to say okay the program is over and uh, everything i need uh, is completed mm -hmm. not everything can be done as a long chain but we are not so worried about this uh, um, because in many cases uh, the resources the, the, the type of programs that we are creating in javascript are infinite loops okay if i have a web server when i start the server the server will keep running on and on so i would need to close the connection only before shutting down the server for example and i can keep it open in a browser the code will start running when um, when I open a web page and until I kill that web page, the call will still be running. So it's very, very unlikely that we hit the end of the program. Okay, because everything will be inside the callbacks that will call our functions without any termination, explicit termination point. So that's uh, usually not a problem in a synchronous code as much as it is in synchronous code. So this would be probably inside a callback. Uh, for a terminate function so it will not be synchronous also in this case mm -hmm. but it's an interesting point because our mind is so accustomed to see uh, the lines of code one after the other that it's very difficult to spot that we are 
actually manipulating some variable before some other operation are done. Um, okay. Uh, okay, so I think that uh, we were discussing about where to put the clause and we understood that there's no in the general case when i have to do many queries there's no real place uh, to, to put that in synchronous code it should be somewhere else um why after is printed before that's the key because uh, the promise contains a callback and this callback will be called asynchronously so uh, in the in line 22 we are not calling this code Okay, we are just saying that this code will execute later. And so right now we are saying print before, um, schedule the other code for later, print after, and when the program is finished, then I have time to execute this db.all. Hmm? So remember that whenever we have a synchronous code, the lines that follow the asynchronous code are in danger zone. Because they could be executed before, they could be executed executed with the wrong with stale data with wrong data. They could change some data before the execution of a function that needs to use them, and so on. So always remember when you are calling an asynchronous function, be extra careful about the lines that follow. If possible, don't have any lines after that. Just close the function. Okay. Uh, when you are calling something asynchronous, usually you don't have anything to do synchronously after this call hmm? because it's too early what you could do after you could also do it before okay so let's try to put the running of all the synchronous code as the last operation in our functions hmm? uh, mark is asking if it's possible to print some temporary value while the asynchronous function is being executed and then change the temporary text with the result to maintain the order of the printing uh, uh with the result to maintain i i it's, it's convoluted i don't know you what i don't know what, what you are trying to print something here log like uh, uh like like this or whatever or we are trying to change some variable i, I i'm not sure i understood what you wanted to do um okay so while marco may be uh, printing something like loading and then substitute okay yes yes uh it, we will we will do that in, in the browser of course so here we will be start writing let's say loading here and then inside in the finally probably we can write or in the then we can write uh, um finished and uh, and so on okay but it will not be after the code it will but it will be inside the the den uh, okay uh, you're suggesting me to do the same with the insert query it's easy to do so function insert number and it's just uh, i think it's insert and just a one uh, so let's take uh, again we return new promise and this promise will take a callback that's not going to return resolve reject and inside this promise we are uh, running query let me copy it Like that and the second parameter so we are running this query and the second parameter is the callback it can only receive an error okay uh, and no value because the, the run doesn't uh, return any value and on this callback if 
we have the error, then we reject the promise with the copy of the error code. Otherwise, we resolve with any value, I don't know, true, for example. We need to call the resolver to have a um, calling of the callbacks. Okay, it's the same. And of course, uh, we, we can then uh, call the insert rows, insert number. It would, we, if, we do, we, if we need to do something after this insert, uh, then we could uh, schedule a then. If we don't need to do some, anything specific, uh, we just can wait it, uh, leave it like there. Uh, we are not uh, forced, we are not obliged to wait for the um, fulfillment of a promise. The code will run and hopefully only if we have something to, to need, uh, then we can put the then method. Otherwise, uh, okay, when it will finish, it will finish. Hmm? But as you say, we are not solving the problem of uh, you executing this code in the loop. No? So if I try to execute this code in a loop, uh, I have still the same problems. Mm -hmm. Of course, because I didn't really Sorry. I never remember what is the keyword for reformatting. Shift Alt F. Okay. Okay. So if I try to execute this code, I will have the same problems as before. Okay. Sorry. Let's remove this temp. You see 12, 12, 12, 12, 13, 14, 14, then skip to 16 and so on. We didn't change the nature of the problem right now, okay? Up to now. We only have a, a, a much simpler syntax to deal with, but again, uh, if we want to synchronize that, uh, we still have the same problem. We worked a lot on, on, the, on the syntax, on the wrapping, and if we don't have a four, everything can work well. So for example, I could put all of this inside the den of the insert number. If I only do it once, if I need only to do it once, we could put like this, then all of this. So this will ensure that the count rows is executed after the result of the then. Okay, and this then can also be pulled outside the nesting because they are all promises. Uh, but even this should not. Uh, resolve the problem in this case we have this strange result uh, because basically what is happening is that all the inserts are done first and then at the completion of each insert uh, this count rows is executed it's, it's one possible threat of execution. It might not be the same. So we see that number is increasing hundreds by hundreds. We know that each count rows will, each count rows will be executed after the insert. I'm doing an insert. When this completes, I do the count rows. The problem is that since there are two different callbacks, insert and uh, count rows, there's no guarantee that they will be executed right one after the other. And so the scheduler decides to do all the inserts before, and then when the insert finishes, uh, it will do all the, these callbacks. Hmm? So mm -hmm. there is a partial ordering. This code 
is executed after this code at every single iteration. For, for one iteration, it's fine. If I only have it once and I run it many times, uh, 17, 18, 19, 20, no problem, because I'm waiting for the program to finish it to start it over again. But when I have many promises in, into a for loop, they, they start all at the same time. Each of them they will, will be the continue on its own thread uh, independently from the other, one the other. The real problem here is that all of them are working on the same shared data. They're manipulating the same data. And so, of course, having different threads of execution, mangling, so modifying and reading the same data is not a good idea in any context, okay? We see a solution for this, okay? For forcing um, a weight. Um, so I say, Alfredo, you don't attend, there's no promise created right. Uh, Alfredo, Oh, if, if we don't append a then, like I did when I wrote just insert number, the promise is created, of course, because the promise is created inside this function. Simply, when the promise resolves, there will be no callback to be called, and it will finish there. But it's still a promise-based mechanism. Hmm? Nobody is uh, linking to the uh, say to the um, to the resolution of the promise. Carlo, if I want to use a file system module, for example, I need to resolve all the stuff I want to do with that file inside the dance. Uh, yes, yes. You need to do to work on the content of the file only in the callback of the promise that gives you the file and so on. Or we wait for the next step. Uh, I'm missing one step. Can I force with native JavaScript keywords asynchronous code? Um, Okay, so you are you are uh, Giuseppe is asking how can I really create a, a synchronous code? There are some library functions uh, that, by their own nature, uh, are asynchronous in the in the API. So everything that depends on them will be asynchronous on top, uh, like timers, uh, like file system access, like uh, uh, um, network access, and so on. So these operations, like the database. Uh, Create uh, um, requires asynchronous access to files, access, so access to the, to, the, to the database file, and so it's asynchronous. So basically, you are creating asynchronous code not just for fun; you are creating it because you are using some resources that uh, uh, are asynchronous in nature: timers, files, network connections, something, uh, user events, uh, key, uh, the keyboard, the mouse, and so on. And that day, they will be um, asynchronous. Uh, there is no parallel computation as you're suggesting uh, because it's all single threaded. So it doesn't make any sense to create a parallelism, uh, just create a new thread or so on. There, there should be, there could be some libraries for threading, but it's not really useful because you don't really have uh, threads or different processes. Okay. Um, if I have a lot of uh, um, promises, I can also combine them in some way. So imagine that we have many promises and we want to execute all of them and wait until all of them are completed and do something when they are completed. So if we are fortunate enough to be able to start them at the same time, we could use, uh, for example, this method uh, promise.all that takes an array of promises so from it at all, uh, no, sorry, I don't have an example here, uh, an array with many promises, promise one, two, three, and then doing something after they all complete. And they take an array of fulfillment values, one for each of the promises. So the idea is uh, we could also do this uh, code in a different way. We could say, okay, it doesn't work yet for the synchronous part, okay? But for the syntax point of view, we could write promise at all. And uh, I have an array with two promises inside them. And this array would be, would be insert number 
the promise returned by insert number and the promise returned by count rows. And what, what I'm doing here is to execute both promises, no guarantee about the order. I'm executing both of them, but don't tell me which one should be first or, or later, we don't know. And only when all of them has, have resolved, I can catch them, get the result. And I get a parameter, which is an array. So I can use the one parameter that contains, sorry, an array of resolution values. So in this case, I can use the structuring. And so the first value will be none and the second value would be uh, the to total number. And so right now we can console.log dot. So let's break it down. I have an array of promises. They will be run. When they all complete, I get an array of results. So I'm a callback with one parameter. This parameter is an array. I know that the first promise doesn't return anything useful to me. So it's just a dummy variable. This is where the underscore comes handy. It's a variable that I don't, I don't even care to give a name to it, but it's there. And the second promise will return me the total number. And so I can print it. So if I'm lucky, this works. Yes. If I try to run it in a loop, again, in the same behavior as before. So it will do whatever it wants. Uh, but it's a way of saying, OK, let's don't do this until all, all these other operations are done. So for example, if you want to close the database here, it could be, and you only have one query, it could be a way. Or the same is uh, the first one, if you have many promises in parallel and you want to execute some code when the first of them will return, there's this other uh, operation race that will tell me, okay, the faster one will get uh, uh, the price at the end. Um, okay. The next step is what you were work, waiting for. So what uh, the underscore stands for, this underscore stands for a variable that I don't, I don't care, I don't need it. So I don't even give it a name. It's a name of a variable, I could have called it Q or whatever, but just by convention, uh, calling it uh, underscore means I, I'm not going to use this value. Okay, it's just a convention. So in, it's a dummy variable. Uh, I need a, a, a variable here in this place because in the first position of the array, there will be this variable, but this promise is not returning anything useful. So this variable, this value will be ignored by me, right? Um, so it's a, an explicit way of saying I don't care about this value, but syntactically I need something there. Uh, so the last step is uh, to, um, it's the easy step, uh, to have a mechanism for waiting synchronously for some asynchronous code to complete. So right now with the then we are able to execute asynchronously because we are in a callback some code when some asynchronous operation completes right can we just stop the execution until the previous code is uh, the, pre the previous promise as completed yes and this is the new syntax that has been added uh, more recently with two no new keywords called async and await. Hmm? Um, they are very simple. Um, they, are, they build on top of promises, so yet another layer, but this one is easy, much easier than the promises to understand. Um, I can declare any function as a synchronous. So any function with any syntax, I just have put the async keyword in front of the function. And it means that this function will automatically return a promise, huh? which is very nice. We don't know, we don't even need to write new, new, return a new promise, blah, blah, blah. 
uh, we just have to say, okay, this is an async function. So every return will be converted into a promise. So it's very easy to have to create new promises if we want. And, uh, and okay, it's uh, any other promise. But the most more interesting keyword is the await keyword that whenever you can, you call an async function, so a function that returns a promise. In any case, when you're calling a function that returns a promise, either when the promise was explicitly created by you or when you're declaring the function as a sync, okay, the await keyword will stop the execution until the, the, the promise is resolved. Okay, so uh, like this, await some expression. If this expression contains a promise, then the, the, the execution will wait until the promise is resolved. And it will go, and really the, the instruction on the next line will be executed after the promise, finally. Huh? We found a way for doing that. Um, if the promise is rejected, then this expression will be converted into a throw. So it's, an, it's a regular JavaScript exception or in a regular JavaScript value. So this value will be the resolve value of the promise. So everything will happen asynchronously and then we wait until all the asynchronous stuff is done and we get the value. When we have the value, we continue with the code. So we are synchronizing the code in a way, okay? Um, and in our code, it's very easy to solve all the problems because then we say, we can say, okay, await, execute the insert number. And we have the insert number to execute that created problems. And we wait until this insert number is finished. At that point only on the next line, we can use the counter, count rows, that gives me a, a value total wait but of course like this I, I i would only have the promise and i would have to wait until the promise is resolved with a wait it's an implicit then that will wait for the promise and only when the promise is resolved will set this variable and right now i can print it Let's try to run this code. Okay, await. Uh, await uh, is only valid in a synchronous. Oh, sorry. Um, there's a detail here that I can use await only if uh, my code is inside a function which is declared a sync. And so I have to rob my main code. Sync function main, let's say, into a, a block. What I'm doing here. Form shift alt F. Okay. Okay, so I need to. Uh, okay. And then to close the brace. Okay, so the await keyword can only be used inside a function that is declared async. So we have to write the wrap our main code into an async function. And of course, the only synchronous instruction in all of this program would be uh, calling the main. We don't need to await for the main it's, uh, because we don't have anything to do after that. So let's try to run it. And I never be happier to see numbers in a row. Okay. So right now there's no, no skips, no duplicates, because everything has been synchronized. You may appreciate that the program is going slower. Because actually we cannot start the counting until after the insert has completed. And we will not start the next insert because of this await uh, 
until the previous count uh, has been uh, returned. This doesn't mean that the, uh, of course, it, um, the, 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 the result will be la available later, but uh, uh, will be correct. It doesn't mean that the program is less efficient because of course these awaits are waiting for something to happen asynchronously and a larger program can do other stuff in parallel with this operation okay before without the synchronization point we will try to rush everything as fast as possible and then we had the, the problem of having uh, inconsistent results uh, because of these race conditions um Okay, let's have a look at some of the questions. Is a function is asynchronous, uh, says Andrea. This means that we could not have information about something obtained from a web resource in the debugger. Uh, I, I'm not sure I understand what you're asking, Andrea. Uh, of course, if the function is asynchronous, uh, it will be more complex to debug. I would have to... Uh, I say, for example, I cannot step step by step inside an asynchronous function. I could set a, a breakpoint in the at the beginning of the function, and so the debugger will be triggered when uh, only when this code is executed. But first of all, I need to set the program so that the code will be executed, and then I can break into it. I cannot just step inside because the step will only uh, or the debugger will only go over synchronous code. Hmm? Um, Vincenzo, I've not understood what await keyword really does. The await stops the synchronous execution until the promise is resolved. Okay, so what we execute after is like we had put it into a then statement. Okay, so this will be executed after the uh, the keyword the um, the code has been um, the promise has been resolved okay uh, lorenzo is suggesting to to write something like this let me try to paste it and so we can read it together uh insert number then count row. yes yes it's the same you are chaining the count rows and the insert and uh, uh so let's try to see if it works we can also try to put this your suggestion here so let's remove this and this should let tot, total is the result of the last promise so we should return this uh, no count rows yes return this promise Okay, because otherwise we are calling the function without returning the value. Let's see if it works. Yes, it does. Hmm. Uh, so in, in this way, you are asynchronous is executing this stuff, and we are you you are blocking the next iteration until the count rows is complete. Yes. If the declare insert number as asynchronous, uh, is asking uh, um, Alessandro, we still need to declare the main function as async. So the, the reason why we need to declare async the main function is because we are using await inside. It's the limitation of the await keyword. The await keyword can only um, be in, used inside the function which is declared async. What is the reason? Oh, the reason is that uh, uh, this function will not run from the start to the end. Will run from the start to this point, and then can be put aside un until this promise is resolved, and then this function will continue the execution later, and so on. So, in a way, the, this function is will not be atomically executed like other synchronous functions because it can be broken down in different steps. That's why they are forcing you to use a sync so that also the caller knows uh, what you are doing. And, uh, and the result of this function, of course, since it's a sync, anything that I can return here, if I return three, it will be converted 
promise because we are inside an asynchronous function. So async is the price that we have to pay to use a weight, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, then uh, Giuseppe, we don't need to put a sync on the declaration of internal number and count rounds. Uh, so first, we don't need to do that because we don't use a weight inside these functions. Uh, these functions are asynchronous because they return promises. Uh, so uh, the important thing uh, for calling uh, a function is that this function will return a promise. Okay, this already does. If we have a normal function, okay, for example, uh, uh, stupid, that will return three, it's stupid. I cannot call it like, uh, uh, let stupid equal to as await uh, stupid. because uh, this is not an asynchronous function and it doesn't so it doesn't return a promise it's just a number but if i put an asynchronous async here okay then it will return a promise that will resolve to three in this case it's a it's an immediate promise the promise is immediately resolved to three so whenever we have some code and we want to return a promise, an easy way is just to create a normal function returning a value. And if you declare it asynchronously, it, it will create automatically a promise around your function and will return uh, that, that value. So async can be used to return promises easily, more easily than creating the object. In this case, uh, uh we still need to do this because we are using a library that doesn't work with promises natively so we need to use callbacks to create the promise but in many other cases we can just uh, uh, declare the function asynchronous and so automatically the promise will be returned if i declare a function asynchronous uh, i need to wait for the result or to use the then because remember this function will always return a promise so i I, there's no guarantee on the order of execution of execution okay uh will the main return a promise yes yes because it's declared as a synchronous so the the result will be converted to a promise and will be forgotten here of course uh could be coding some number like away no 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 await uh, vincenzo wait is not a keyword for defining function is a keyword for calling them okay we could uh, write it async function is a number. Of course, we, you can do that. It doesn't do any harm because it's already returning a promise. So it doesn't change anything. You can do that or not. Maybe if you want to be more explicit, you can do that. But uh, the condition of, for, a, for using a weight, uh, like we have in the slides, uh, uh, what is that? Uh, The await was calling an async function, a function declared async, or a function returning a promise. Um, yeah, okay. Can you use resolve and reject inside the async function? Yes. And uh, I think it's the same. Uh, uh, it's linked to the um, to the question by Matteo. What, how can uh, we deal with failure okay this is easy because uh, the reject inside the promise will be converted into an exception so you this error inside the insert number you can detect it with a try catch you can do that and the um, The catch the, the error here. So whenever I use the await, so what happens is that await converts resolve into the return value and reject into an exception. 
and a sync is doing the reverse a sync when it creates um, a promise like this one it will create it will convert the return into the result so they can be cached with them and uh, uh, an error um, an exception into a reject so we are actually equating uh, the normal synchronous mechanisms of returning a value or returning an exception with a throw to the promise based asynchronous methods of resolve and reject and async and await will do all the conversions for you okay usually you choose a style you try not to mix them but actually there there are always promises in sometimes you are hiding the promises instead of just a return and letting a value but real, the real mechanism, uh, async and await, are just hiding for you the promises that are the ones that are really doing the, all the work. Okay, the work is still promise based. Just, you just don't see them because the promise is automatically created and resolved, and the result value is uh, automatically extracted and uh, returned uh, as an expression. Um, okay. Uh, Await insert number. Chumbiao is asking regarding the result of insert number, it will continue. Uh, except if the insert number generates an, an exception, so it's a rejected value, then it will generate a, a, an exception at this level of code and depends on whether you are catching or not the code. If you are not catching the expression, it could interrupt the problem. But uh, uh, so if the if the promise is resolved, then it will continue the code. If the promise is rejected, it will generate an exception and then you decide whether to catch it or not. Uh, Cloud is, is telling us that the frequency of the, this error, probably uh, you, you didn't open the right database or you uh, close it too soon. So you are closing database before completing the queries for the synchronous problem. Try to check the close. Hmm? um may we have the db close before the end of this operation if we put the db close in the last line yes in this case we can do that so let's come go back to the original version like this right now we are sure that here we can close the db but here but not there okay because the main is asynchronous and so this instruction we may be executed we we never know before the body of the main okay um okay i think that uh, we had a quite a um a rush this morning and uh it's uh, this this was quite longer uh, so it's probably uh, okay. I still have some questions. I get this question, and then we can uh, away, uh, can do a break uh, so that your brain can reset a bit about all of this asynchronous stuff uh, and get a synchronous coffee. Um, uh, Umberto is asking: Will we be using uh, ES modules? Uh, ES modules will be the default in the browser. Uh, unfortunately, Node uh, is still not that is still not to totally converted to ES modules. Uh, um but in the browser there will be the, the default um anyway just remember we are doing some you know, we are just learning the language so right now we are writing co uh, pro synchronous program that has a beginning and at the end uh from two weeks after today we will only be writing or servers or web applications that keep constantly running so all this problem, of course, they will be all asynchronous. So some of the, the, these details about uh, finishing the program and the top level uh, uh, of the program will not be a problem anymore. Okay. Um, uh, okay. So we are yeah, somebody is trying to uh, cloudy to debug the problem, but. Uh, uh, good luck with that. Uh, probably it's uh, uh, no set table numbers. I, 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 Claudio, just uh, try, try to clarify because you said we often get the error. Do you often get or do you always get the error? Because then 
will drive to co totally different uh, direction. If, if the error is there sometimes and sometimes not, maybe it's an asynchronous problem. If you always get the error, it's probably a path or a permission problem. How were asynchronous operation handled before promises uh, with much uh, blood and sweat? Hmm? So all we call backs and it was uh, really complex. Hmm? And uh, by doing your own schedules and libraries to help you, gladly we are after this thread. Hmm? Just also remember that uh, uh, when the JavaScript language was, pro was progressing, also the complexity of web applications were, pro were progressing. So uh, 10 years ago, there were not so complex web applications as we have today. This is also because the language has enabled the usage and the easier usage of some features. Okay, so uh, are you okay for a break? Okay, I, I was sure about that. And uh, let's uh, come back in 15 minutes. Uh, there will um, be 10 35. Okay, see you later. <laughs>